now a full complement uh, with us. And so, as Jenny High, I'm principal of St George's, a very warm welcome to hear people's inaugurals. And on this occasion, we have somebody very special, Baroness Sheila Hollins, to give the introduction. And indeed, the relationship was that of PhD supervisor and student. So, thank you very much. Well, it's, it's lovely to be back here at St George's. Um, we've had learning disability, academic work in, um, about learning disability here for a very long time because on this site uh, was the Fountain Hospital. Um, and there was academic work going on there in uh, genetics and uh, pathology and, and so on. And people living there who subsequently moved to live at Queen Mary Scott Shilton. However, the first clinical professor in the United Kingdom in learning disability was made here in 1980, which was quite an extraordinary um, uh, thing for St George's at that time to do. And it came about because of the closure of the problems at Normansfield Hospital. Um, well, this week, the uh, NHS 10-year plan was launched, and you'll have seen it in the news. But did you notice that learning disability is one of the four clinical priorities and work about end-of-life care for people with learning disabilities is specifically part of the brief um, within the new 10-year plan. This is the first time learning disability has been uh, had such a high profile and such a, such a priority. So that's, this makes this chair um, for Irene very, very timely indeed. I just wanted to mention a, a little bit about how Irena first came to St George's. It was actually Dame Cecily Saunders who recommended her to me because I was running a deaf and dying course um, on a regular basis here for many, many years. And although Dame Cecily herself, who'd founded the St Christopher's Hospice, had, had uh, helped with the course a couple of times, she said we really needed somebody um, who could make something of this going forward. And she recommended Irena, and Irena came and joined us and taught on the course. And then we had a research uh, grant and an opportunity to do some research looking at um, the experience of people with learning disabilities who were, who were bereaved. And we persuaded Irena to come and work with us. So that was, I can't remember how long ago, but it's quite a long time ago. And since then, of course, we, we've done a lot of work together. Um, when I retired as a professor, my inaugural election, my husband who's here reminded me, uh, was about 18 years ago. But when I retired as a professor, my post wasn't replaced, and so the joy I feel to see Irena now becoming a professor um, and for learning disability and academic work in learning disability really to be continuing in this high-profile way is very exciting. Irena's PhD, which was mentioned, was supervised jointly by myself and Dr Leopold Kerf from uh, Maastricht University, and so um, that's uh, uh, wonderful that you're here as well, Leopold, and I'm sure that Irena will note that. But Irena's postdoctoral research was funded by the NIHR, quite unusually in learning disability to get an NIHR grant. And the study was a very important one about hospital patient safety experience. Um, it's been an influential study. Um, it's had profound importance for doctors and nurses in all areas of clinical practice. And Irene also led a European task force that produced a white paper establishing European norms and standards for palliative care of people with learning disabilities. This white paper is not only influencing policy and practice um, here in Europe, but worldwide as far away as Australia. And incidentally, this was mostly written whilst Irene was undergoing chemotherapy herself. So um, you can tell that she's a pretty remarkable person, whilst also writing a blog about her own experience um, with a wonderful name, When Al Had Cancer. Irene is going to tell us a very important story tonight. It will sound like quite a simple story, and it's one that everyone here will be able to understand in their own way. But there's nothing simple in what we're going to hear. It's a story about empathy, communication, and honesty. But most importantly, it's a story about collaboration, which is why we waited for you, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> this is clinical research at its best. Irena, I'm so looking forward to hearing what you're going to share tonight, and I know everybody else is too. Thank you. Thank you. 
Don't do the need that one. Thank you, Sheila. Very generous words. Now, how does a nurse who loves being with patients and families end up as a university professor, you might ask? Right? And in fact, I, I'm wondering that myself, how did I get her here? So the short story goes like this. 20 years ago, I was a nurse <laughs> at Trinity Hospice in Clapham here in South London. And I absolutely loved being with patients and the families and their stories. It's, people thought, well, you must be a saint, it must be a really sad place, but actually hospices are surprisingly uplifting places, perhaps because of that focus on people's stories and their families. So, and the time towards death is incredibly important because it isn't really about death, that is a time that's about life and about your relationships. So dying in a way that is as good as possible Whatever that means for you is hugely important. You know, it really is a case of all's well that ends well. And I worked out that in my first five years on the hospice, I must have been with about a thousand patients, dying patients and their families. I still counted them. I think it's about a thousand. <laughs> yeah. It was a huge privilege because in one bed you've got the lord of the manor and in the next bed you've got the retired milkman. You know, it's, it, they say that death is the great leveller. You really see everything in the hospice, except people with learning disabilities. Because in those five years, I had one patient with a learning disability. And now you'll notice that I will say learning disability rather than intellectual disability, which is my official title. Intellectual disability is the internationally recognised term, but here in England we use the term learning disability. And most of you are from England, so that's what I will use tonight. So one patient. Now why is that? Because 2.5% of the population have a learning disability. So if access to hospice care is equal, I should have seen about 25 people with learning disabilities in all that time. So why weren't they there? I can think of three possibilities. Number one, people with learning disabilities don't die. <laughs> they have eternal life. Now, I don't think that's true. I know it's not true. These are all friends of mine who have died in the last few decades, and all of these ten people had a learning disability. So they do die. So possibility number two is that people with learning disabilities die of things that don't need hospice, like walking under a bus or having a sudden heart attack. Now, as Sheila mentioned, there is, we don't really know enough about this yet. There is finally now a national mortality review going on that looks into the... It's possible that people die of slightly different things. They certainly die a lot younger, generally. But I also know that a lot of people with learning disabilities would benefit from hospice care. And of these ten friends, only two died of a heart attack or walking under a bus. Everybody else would have really uh, benefited from some sort of um, palliative care. So that leaves us with possibility number three, which is that death is not the great leveller after all. And I began to suspect that rather than people with learning disabilities never dying or never being bereaved, it was that their needs weren't recognised and they were being ignored. We did sometimes have patients with, in the hospice, like Mary here, who had a son or a daughter with a learning disability, and this is what it would look like in the notes. That person would be called SEN, Special Educational Needs, and you never saw them. No questions were ever asked. They might as well not exist, have existed. People with learning disabilities in those days were quite literally nameless. Literally nameless. So... There I was, nursing my patients at Trinity Hospice, and I had done my um, care of the dying course, and I had to do an assignment, and for my assignment, I wrote about people with learning disabilities who were bereaved. And there was just about, not very much, but just about written enough about this for me to be able to write my assignment and pass it. And then somebody asked, well, what if it isn't the bereaved person who has the learning disability, what if it's the patient who has the learning disability? What do we know about this? 
Now, I knew that, that you have to go to the literature to find the answers to the literature. So, and, and as luck would have it, I've done my course, I had learned how to do a literature search. What you do is you go to the computer and you put in learning disability and death and dying and up come all the articles that anybody anywhere in the world has written about this topic. So I did this and this was what happened. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing, not a single article written anywhere in the world about the end-of-life care needs of people with learning disabilities. So I thought, well, let me just write then about that one patient that we've had on the ward. And I did, and I sent it to the Nursing Times, and they published it in 1997. And that is the short story of how you become an international expert overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and a professor 20 years later. <laughs> Because for many years, this was the only thing that would come up if people did a literature search. So, there, so that's the short story. And my mission really over the past 20 years has been to include everybody, including people with learning disabilities, in all's well that ends well. Because if you're not paying attention to how people end their lives and the final, the final months, really, the final time, and to their deaths and their bereavements, if that doesn't matter, then what you're really saying is that people's lives don't matter. So it's very important. But this is an inaugural lecture, so I am allowed to tell you the long story. <laughs> okay? And thinking about this long road to my professorship, I realised I really did not get here on my own. It's with all of you, really. Um, there are lots of people who have inspired me, who have been my mentors, who have been leading lights, inspirational people. So I will introduce you this evening to some of those people. I'm also going to tell you some of my pivotal moments, the aha moments in my career. And as you will see that mostly of these moments involve people with learning disabilities. But let's start at the beginning. <laughs> you recognize that, yeah, you've been. <laughs> <laughs> we have been, yes, that's right. But that's my mum, and I'm the one in the middle with my two sisters. I grew up in, in, in the Netherlands. Here I am, age four. Spot the girl with the career plan. <laughs> Not sure what it says about the prospects of my sisters. <laughs> my youngest sister here, there she is. I don't know either. But I was four, but actually I was 12 when I knew that I wanted to be a nurse. And I remember the moment exactly. Because my aunt, Agnes, Tante Agnes, who is now 80 years old, has managed to come over from Amsterdam. Very, very welcome. She came to our house um, and, and for a project that actually my younger sister did for school about what people's jobs involve, she came to talk about her work and she was a nurse. Um, and I thought, aha, this <laughs> is what I want to do. This fits in very nicely with my career plan, my future ambition. The future ambition that I had when I was that age was to save the world. That's what I was going to do. So that was good. When you're young, you think you can do that. So here I am, six years later, at my nursing college. Things changed a bit over the years, as you can see in nursing training. 1981. And quite a few of these people actually are now saving the world. There's Astrid, my friend, standing next to me, there she is, um, who is now a learning disability nurse in Hertfordshire. There's Carla, there she is in the front row, um, who is an oncology nurse in Amsterdam. Those are really inspirational friends and absolutely wonderful. But this is me, and this wow. picture is literally taken outside my mum's house and I'm on my way to England. Right? I'm going to go... I need all that stuff. I'm going to go and spend a couple of months, I thought, in a community called Lash. Now, Lash are communities where people with learning disabilities and without learning disabilities live and work together in a spirit of mutuality and sharing. So I thought, well, that's good, because then I'll kill two birds with one stone. Not only will I be saving the world, because I'll be helping people, um, and I'll learn English, which will be useful. Okay? And I ended up with this really wonderful group of people. I'm there in the yellow. Um, we lived together in a house for about, I lived there for about a year and a half in the end, with nine people, four of whom had a learning disability. 
And the beauty of living in Laash was that you stop being the carer and the cared for because you do everything together, cooking together, celebrating together. Did my mum come over for Christmas lunch? You relax together. <laughs> you know, you have fun together. So, wonderful. But the challenge of Laash is that you stop being the carer and the cared for and you become both the carer and the cared for. So here I am, I was ill, and it was Michelle, who was my roommate, who looked after me. Oh. <laughs> um, so, who's saving the world there? It certainly wasn't me. So that was another aha moment. That I can't save the world, actually. I have to do this together. We all, it's, it's, not, you know, it, I, it's not me helping other people. And actually, as an by the nice thing is that does make for lifelong friendships. This is Michelle, just, just very recently, that kind of sharing. So I stayed. I ended up staying for, um, in the end for eight years. I helped set up a new home, um, which is wonderful group of people. And I can see some people here smiling because they recognize themselves in these photographs. Um, that included people with very severe and profound learning disabilities. And thank goodness, after this was well before Brexit, um, because if I had come under the proposed new immigration rules, I would have been sent back after about a year to the Netherlands, not allowed back in, and I would definitely not be standing here in front of you today. So I just thought I'd get that one in. <laughs> Thank goodness, because I ended up marrying Michael, who's the man you saw earlier, the, uh, <laughs> on our wedding day. This is around with our good friend Philip, um, who was our best man, and he then became the godfather to our daughter, who was sitting there with a the flowery jumper on. Um, and now we're on the family album. Um, that's the last one from the family album. Oh. That's my family now. So there's Clara, um, Susanna, who is busy with GCSE exams, so she can't be here tonight, oh. and Dom at the back, and Michael. And I'm telling you all this because my time in Laash has shaped the way I approach research. The absolutely crucial importance of, um, of sharing and, and realizing that you really do share a common humanity. Importance of listening to everybody's short story and really <coughs> learning that everybody has something to contribute, whatever their ability or disability, and that the more diverse, the better, really, is there, and the richer things are. So it, I really learned in life not to be doing for, but to be together um, without necessarily knowing best. And I'm still using that knowledge now when now we bring together very diverse groups of people. This is our most recent research advisory group to help us to think about research. I can't imagine now doing research without listening to everybody's stories and seeing how they fit into the bigger picture and without pe including people with learning disabilities themselves. So as you've just heard, um, after I've worked, in, I've worked, I was in Marsh for eight years, I worked in the hospice for eight years, and then I was approached by um, then Professor Sheila Hollett, now Baroness Hollins, who introduced me so generously, who as you've heard was working here at the time, head of the department. Um, and the project that she mentioned, it was to improve access to service, to cancer services and help people with bereavement, with learning disabilities. Um, Three-year project. She said, do you want to come and lead that? So I did. I just leave, left the hospice for what I thought was going to be three years. Um, now, one thing Sheila did here in the department was to employ people with a learning disability to be training advisors, research advisors, co-researchers. Now remember, this, we're talking 20 years ago, this was wow. revolutionary. And it still is, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> revolutionary. And so, <coughs> Gary, you are my, um, our, our co-researcher mm -hmm. at the time, here we are, we'll talk a bit more about you later on. <coughs> Um, because <laughs> it is going back a bit. The hair has oh, changed yeah. colour, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But first I want to say a little bit more about um, Baroness Hollins because she is really inspirational. Her leadership and vision has been extraordinary um, and, and has really inspired me and, and, and shaped my career in so many ways. Many of you will be familiar with her really invaluable books beyond words. These are 
books were, uh, for people with learning disabilities that have pictures and no words that help them to communicate about issues that affect their life. This is the book that we produced for that cancer project. I can't imagine doing research or teaching or, or making a PowerPoint presentation without these wonderful pictures. So that is really very, um, very important. And it's also from Sheila that I really learned to include people with learning disabilities in even the most complex of meetings um, and to always keep them as your focus for everything. Um, so she's been invaluable. The other person who has been crucial to my academic career has been the wonderful professor Dr. Leopold Curves, um, who has been spearheading um, intellectual disability research in the Netherlands in, at Maastricht University. Um, we met at a conference somewhere in France um, and he invited me to do a PhD by publication in, in, in the Netherlands and it was supervised jointly by Sheila, by these two inspirational people. Um, and I um, got my PhD in 2007. Very nice formal event that was. So here I am at the beginning of my research career. Uh, I decided to stay. Um, that's the long story. I was started to stay because I said actually somebody really ought to do some research, some proper research in this field. And this seemed to be the perfect place to do it with Sheila and Jane Bernal and Gary and, and all these other wonderful people. But let me stop talking here um, for a few minutes because I think this is a good time to stop and introduce you to some of the, pay the people with learning disabilities and their families who have inspired me. So this um, is Victoria Wilson and her mother Jean. Uh, um, Victoria had profound learning disabilities um, and died about five years ago of kidney failure related to tuberous sclerosis that she was born with. Victoria shared um, a flat with her friends who lived independently, which is unusual for somebody with such profound needs, but she had a whole team um, of support staff around the clock, and of course her family lived nearby. And when Victoria became terminally ill, they had the support of the local palliative care team and really worked well together to make sure that Victoria was able to stay at home and die at home. So I'm going to show you an extra extract from a filmed conversation that we had just a couple of months ago, Jean and I, um, where Jean talks about Victoria's very final hours. Um, and in this bit of the film, I've just asked Jean whether she thought that Victoria knew that she was dying. It's difficult to, do, to say really because although she was never able to explain anything to me as her mum, I used to tell her everything that was happening and I used to say to her, lovey, you can go whenever you want, you know, just when you're ready, you, you can just close your eyes and just go. Um, she stopped eating. It, it was a battle to get her any food into her for about a year. And then about a month, she really didn't want to eat. So I think, I don't know whether she knew in her heart, just stop this. Um, and the palliative team told us in those last 48 hours, don't give her anything because it will make her even more uncomfortable. Mm. But I... When I look back now, I think that was her way of saying, well, it's enough, enough, I'm going to go. Mm. Um, I don't know, who can say? Who can say? Mm. I certainly think she chose her moment. Mm. I certainly think mm. she did. What makes you think that? Well, she'd had a restless night. I'd been with her all day, uh, and she'd, she'd had a restless night, and the member of staff on had... had um, never seen anybody die and she told me she was really really nervous because I said if it's going to happen it's going to happen in the early hours Norman and Tara had gone home to get some sleep and at about quarter past two she I, I 
was just in the kitchen making a, yet another cup of coffee. Mm. And she came and she said, she's making funny noises. And um, I came back in and um, the whole bedroom was full of light. The bathroom door was open. And I said, no, no, we must turn everything off. We just left her fairy lights on. And I found this music that really used to make her relax. And it's um, called Namaste. It's monks singing and bells and stuff. Very peaceful. And um, I put some of her favourite lemon um, just stick things. And um, I said to Emma, she's going to go soon. And she, she said, she, I can't. I said, just calm down. She's going to go. Just hold her hand, tell her you're here. And then her breath changed. I said, she's gone, Emma, she's gone. And mm. I just held her in my arms for a bit and sent mm. Emma out to make me another cup of tea and to go and call Norman and Tara. And uh, it was very peaceful. And mm. she looked beautiful. Mm. All the pain lines had gone and mm. her skin had become pink again. It wasn't yellow. Um, and I'm not sure whether she had a smile, but she looked relaxed. She looked so relaxed. And mm. then her sister came. More tears and, and her dad. And then I said, um, and now we're going to give her the final gift that we can give her. We're going to wash her and dress her in uh, the clothes that we think would be good. And Emma and her sister were so shocked. They said, oh, we can't. I said, yes, you can. It's the last gift we can give her. We'll change the bedding and we'll make her look beautiful. Mm. And they were so pleased that they did that in the end. Thank you, Jean, for sharing the story with us. Now you can see how good Victoria's death was, but also how deeply it affected everybody, her family, her staff, how much support the staff needed. And that is not unusual. The staff are often not experienced this before, and they may well be young, so they need a lot of support. And Victoria's needs were so complex that, that we did need a lot of collaboration and the sharing of skills and of mutual trust and so what i want to know really is how we can make um such good practice mainstream so that it's not completely dependent <coughs> on people having such wonderful families as uh, and, and carers and staff who go the extra mile <coughs> but the needs of people with learning disabilities are are so diverse and can be so unpredictable that you can't make fixed rules about how to support them. So I've got a lovely fancy new title as Professor of Learning Disability and, and Palliative Care, but I can't tell you what this man who has a learning disability, who is dying, what he needs, because I don't know him. You really have to treat people as absolute individuals find out what our individual needs are and for people with learning disabilities they really are the most individual and the most complex and sometimes the most unusual of needs and that means that if if i reach the end of my life and i need to be supported by a hospice team or a hospital team and that team gets it right for people like john in this bed then i can be absolutely sure that they'll get it right for me too okay and as Sheila said, the, you know, this is important for the, also for the NHS, because in a long-term plan that's came out this very week, it specifies, I quote from the plan, the NH NHS will personalise care to improve end-of-life care. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, it's people with learning disabilities who will teach you how to personalise care. And to get that right, you need to overcome a lot of challenges. For example, how can you actually tell that somebody is reaching the end of life? How, with Victoria, this was an issue, for example, how do you know whether, you know, the sort of times of deterioration of ill health, people have complex needs all their life sometimes, you know, how, how do you know? People communicate differently, so that could be an issue. 
how are you going to make sure that somebody is comfortable and not in pain if they communicate that pain in not in words but sometimes in ways that might be slightly unconventional how are you going to make sure that decisions that you make are based on the person's own needs and their own wishes even if that person lacks the capacity to make decisions or can't tell you what their wishes are how are you going to do that how will you work together with you know complex groups of family and staff and all sorts of people involved how are you include, going, to, going to include the person friends, their peers, the other person, the people with learning disabilities, who are very often ignored? So these have been, and still are, some of our research questions. So I was at the beginning of my research <coughs> career. Now, where do you start when you want to find out about something that really not very much is known about? I think you start by listening to people's stories, because that way you really learn what, uh, what the issues are, um, what matters to people, what is not working well, what is working well, and how we might improve things. So I wrote a grant application to do my first big research project, and I got my first lesson in grant application rejection, <laughs> which is an extremely useful and important lesson for any researcher to, <laughs> to learn. But we persisted, and we finally got a grant from Cancer Research UK to do a three-year study to try and understand what it was like for people with learning disabilities to have cancer. And these are two books that came out of that study. One is a storybook, which I've written the stories of all these people, and one is a picture book. Um, it was an ethnographic study. Now that means that what I was trying to do was to see the world through the eyes of the people in the study. Um, so there were 13 people with learning disabilities in the study, all of whom had cancer, 11 of whom died. Um, two people survived. Of this, I'm under your one, so that is, I'm very, very glad that you did. <laughs> we'll talk a bit more about you later. Um, but 11 <coughs> people died. So, and I learned a tremendous amount from them and from their families um, and, and from their staff. And what I'm going to tell you about is analysing the data from that study. How did we make sense of my 2,000 pages of notes that I had, um, which were read? in one long sitting by uh, Jane Bernal, my colleague, and Sheila and, and various other learned colleagues read the summaries of, of these 30 stories. And each of us sat down and, and pulled out what we thought were the most important themes. You know, what was it that people needed in this study? And we talked about it together and we came up with, well, and we all came up with more or less the same thing. So we were quite pleased about that. One of them was um, that people needed competent, symptom control. They wanted to be not in pain, they wanted to be comfortable. Um, they needed to have carers who are well supported, uh, because Victoria's staff, as, as Jean was saying, you know, was quite sort of anxious and frightened. That was not unusual. People were very inexperienced, the staff, and they needed a lot of support, so that was important. People wanted contact with their family, sometimes re-establishing contact with their friends. Um, so all those things, we said, this is very good, we've got it sorted, we've got all our themes. And then Gary, you and I sat down for one afternoon a week for three months. And every afternoon we went through one of these stories. Okay? And the aim was to get Gary's perspective on what you thought were the most important things that came out of these stories. And let me tell you, getting the perspective of somebody like Gary, who has lived in one of those staffed residential care homes, like many people in my study did, is really something else. So, for example, there was one man, there was one situation which all us learned professionals thought was really rather negative. Right? This was a man with Down syndrome, who had advanced bladder cancer, who was very ill, who lived in a home which was managed by a manager who we thought was, I thought was very patronising. She called people my pets, quite literally. She talked about I liked the people were dogs. Um, she was patronising the home, but the people were treated like children. The home was not stimulating. And on top of all that, she did not believe in morphine. So this man was in pain, I could see it. And in fact, that was one time that I stepped out of my neutral researcher role and got the palliative care team in because that really wasn't good. 
So, lots of dubious things. And then, Gary, I told you that story, and I remember exactly what you said. You said, oh, that's a heartwarming story. And I said, oh, is it? Why? And, he, and you said, Gary, because that home manager loved him. And you went on to explain that, that in your experience, it's quite unusual um, that staff really deeply care about you. And she even actually, I mean, she did. Um, you know, she, she really cared for the man. She wanted him to die at home. She made it possible. She truly grieved for him after he died. And you said, well, that is unusual because often staff are not really interested in what I've got to say. You know, you tell them something that matters to you and they're busy doing their paperwork and all that yeah, um, and, so and, and not really listening. So for you, for Gary, having somebody who, you know, for, really so, to, to love you was what mattered more than anything. So what we took from that was the importance of a close bond with your carers hmm? and how this can transform your experience, not just of life, but also of dying. And we looked at all the other 12 stories again, and I think it's the same comes through in Jean in your story, because all that competence was important, but it's the love that made that a good death for, for Victoria. So we took for that that is important, and we looked at all 12 stories, and we found that actually most people, it mattered to everybody, and, and fortunately almost everybody had such care. It could be a family member, it could be also be a member of staff. Yeah? What people wanted at the end of life was to be cared for by people who love you, and for whom you matter. So there were a couple of aha moments there. The first one is that the needs of people with learning disabilities are really no different from anybody else's. Because I suspect that if, if you really think about it, you know, when you come to the end of your life, what you want is to know that your life has mattered, and that you have been loved, that you have people who have loved you. It's important for everybody, but for people with learning disabilities, there is a real bigger question about how we support that kind, those kind of bonds <laughs> and how we support the families who are deeply bereft but whose bereavement is not always recognised as very important. Sometimes people say it's for the best if somebody dies with a learning disability. How do you support the staff who um, you know, think that they, want, they need to be professional but actually who do form very close bonds often. And the second aha moment was that, I that everybody looks at the same situation from a different perspective. And if we truly want to understand the perspectives of people with learning disabilities, then we have to include them in all of our study, including the analysis. Um, and you know, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is really important. And Gary, we were so excited about this that we wrote an article about it. Um, because you really showed me how to do that, and that was that is really very, very helpful indeed. So one thing that came out of that study really loud and clear, that was an issue for everybody, was knowing how to talk to people with learning disabilities about death and dying. Do you tell them the truth, and if so, how you do it, and who should do it, was an issue for everybody. Mm. And there were only two people in that study who knew exactly what was happening, but for, even for them, you know, you were one of those, Amanda, even for them it was difficult because the families and staff were so unprepared to talk. So I developed guidelines from the, from the we did lots of follow-up research. Um, we got together the groups of staff and groups of doctors and groups of nurses and groups of people with learning disabilities and we asked them about bad news and you know, all their experiences and that's what these guidelines came out of and there's a, a website as well. But this is, uh, and, and, and uh, this, Amanda, this is where you come in because um, for all our follow-up research after you were the participant in that study, we employed Amanda to be a co-researcher on all our Breaking Bad News research, and you're still working with us 10 years later. We've done lots of work together. We've done lots of talks together. This probably was our biggest ever gig in Madrid. 2,000 people, this is nothing. <laughs> it was nothing, it was really big. But I have to say, it was very big, wasn't it? I was expecting it to be as big as it 
No, I wasn't expecting that either. And the thing is, I'm, I'm doing usually, you know, if there's delicate feedback about how your talk was, I'm usually sort of okay, 8 out of 10, you know, I score quite well. I can never beat the Manda score. 10 out of 10, always, sometimes 11 out of 10. So, and you said you would help me with my inaugural lecture, but I think an inaugural lecture I have to do myself, really. Um, but... But every time when I come with you, it, it, it always works, even though I was very naughty doing it. Actually. I know, but to listen, you mustn't say anything now, because I have to speak today. But... <laughs> but... It's all right, because I've got the next best thing, which is this film we made about six years ago. So this is Amanda talking on film about bad news. See, this is your chance to speak, Amanda. We can just listen to what you said six years ago. When, uh, when my mum got sick, she, she, didn't, she didn't tell me that she was sick. She kept, she, she kept it to herself. And I, I found that very difficult because, because she, sh she should have told me what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I was 13 years old when, uh, and, she, uh, and she did not tell me that, that, she, that she, was, she was going to die. Because she wanted to protect protect me, she didn't think I would understand what what was happening. When she had the people from the hospice there, she told me to go away, and she was shouting at me all the time, and it wasn't it wasn't very nice for me being being in that situation. Because, because she, she, she must have been feeling uh, angry, why is this happening to her? But she still should have told me what was going on. It would, it would have pre prepared me for maybe when I found her dead instead of not f um, going upstairs and finding her, it was a shock. It was scary. Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. It took a long time for me to find out And the the hospital the hospital couldn't f couldn't find anything wrong with me, and they didn't tell me what what was go what was going on, uh, and I felt really frightened and scared that I was I was left on on my own for a long time. And nobody was explaining to me what was wrong. Because they thought that I wouldn't understand because I had a learning disability. Thank you, Amanda. And I've learned a tremendous amount from Amanda, and, and perhaps even more so when as Sheila mentioned, four years ago, I myself have a diagnosed with cancer and I had to go some some very, very dreadful treatments. Um, so, and in this picture, I'm being recovered and we're wearing each other's chemotherapy wigs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was good for me, but maybe not so good for you. <laughs> um, so, but, but it, it did make me realise, I mean, it made me realise how dreadful these treatments are, how difficult, it made me really wonder how on earth you've coped with it. So we went back and we talked a lot more then, um, which made me realise how much we have in common, but also how much more disadvantaged Amanda had been compared with me um, because of her learning disability. She was so much more dependent on other people to make sure you got the right care um, and to get through it. 
I was very lucky with my wonderful GP, <laughs> um, who Liz Williams, who dragged me through my year of treatments, really by listening to me. I mean, it, again, it was important just for, not for everybody that you're being listened to, but in very stark contrast, trust, your GP and mine didn't believe you when you were telling them what was going on with your initial cancer thing, and they kept sending you home saying nothing is wrong. Um, and it took you to collapse in the street, literally, before you were admitted and never trying to figure it out. If it had been for me coming here and doing the training to teach GPs how to communicate with people with learning disabilities, I don't think I would have yeah. uh, had to do that. And to do uh, being seconds as well. It was true of being seconds. So, uh, yeah. I knew so it was, you know, it, there's a lot of issues there. And so we, we've learned a lot together about all that. And over the years, we've tried and sometimes we've succeeded in finding new ways of listening to people with a learning disability. And I will tell you, uh, in, in our research studies, I will tell you about one example that really illustrates um, how you have to do things differently sometimes and how you have to make reasonable adjustments in your research to make sure that people with a learning disability can contribute to them. So we um, had called together a focus group, um, six people with learning disabilities were one of the groups. Everybody in the group had somebody in their family who'd had cancer. So for most people that was a, a, a mum or a dad who'd died of cancer. And you, Gary, Gary and Amanda were both helping me to run those groups, yeah, to facilitate them. Yeah, you remember that, Gary. Yeah. And we showed them, one of the things we did, we showed them this picture. I think we said, this is a man, a young man, his dad is very ill, his dad is going to die. And we asked the group, what do you think this man is worrying about? What, what is, what, 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 what's going on for this man? And there was one man in the group, he, he said, oh, he, he, he wants to ask the doctor a question. So I thought, well, this is going well, right? This is good. So because he, I we asked people questions before about their own experience, nothing came out. This is this is good. So I said, oh, what well, good? What, what what do you think he wants to ask the doctor? But he wouldn't tell me. He couldn't tell me. So I said, well, what if I pretend to be the doctor and you, the man, and, and nothing happened? It wasn't until we put you, Amanda, in the role of doctor, saying, well, Amanda, you can be the doctor, that several people in the group came forward, came to you and, and the questions were pouring out. Why do people have cancer? One moment my dad was all right and the next moment he was dead. How does that happen? You know, why? So all this, all this, this things came out and this was really two or maybe even more aha moments there. Number one is that we found that storytelling was a much more effective way of getting people to share their own experiences and their own feelings and thoughts and views than just asking them about themselves. And this is where Sheila's books Beyond Words really became invaluable. The second one was that however approachable and friendly and low-key, you know, there I go with my jeans and I look sort of, you know, down with the, uh, you know, low-key, but I'm still somebody in authority and people with learning disabilities will be worried that they tell me what I want to hear. Um, and so we broke the rules of research. We says that you mustn't talk about your own views and your own experiences if you're a researcher. You have to be neutral. And Gary and Amanda, you, you shared your own experiences and your own views. And Gary, you were very good at telling me that I use difficult words and what on earth does it mean. Um, and that actually got people talking. So you were role models. You know, this was a real... And so I would never now again run a focus group with people with learning disabilities without having co-researchers with me. But of course, there are challenges with that. Um, for one thing, you have to make your language really easy and simple and straightforward. You have to make sure that you all know what you mean. Um, so this is one of our agendas and minutes are similar you really can't hide behind jargon. Mm -hmm. And it's actually having to, to conduct your meetings without jargon in a simple language is surprisingly helpful. I mean, just think back to the last meeting you've been to and try to summarize in one sentence what it was about <laughs> and what it was for. It can be a challenge. If you can't do that, then it's usually because the meeting is a bit unclear or your study is unclear and you, you haven't quite got that yet. And I was told off really fairly recently by a group of people, Michelle and David, you were in that group, 
um, when I talked about stakeholders and tried to explain that we're all stakeholders, and they said, no, 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 this is a stakeholder. It's <laughs> 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 not a stakeholder. <laughs> So you do really have to be careful of your language. And it's the same, you know, I'm on, honestly, how, how many euphemisms do we use for death and how confusing is that, right? Allegedly there are four dead people on these pictures, but I can see only one, I think he's properly dead. But this person is simply pushing up the daisies. <laughs> Here's somebody who's kicked the bucket. Now this person, what do you think, he's gone from cloud... Ten, nine to live on cloud ten. Now this is a euphemism we've heard a lot with him learning disabilities. He's gone to a better place. So really you have to be very careful about your words and, and use the word dead often. Mm -hmm. And even then, what does that mean? Um, do people understand what it means? I'm going to show you just a minute and a half of a video that I made with, um, um, with, with one of the, our research advisors, uh, Monica, who is the parent Hi, Monica. They're all here. It's wonderful. Um, who is the parent of, of your son, James, who is 40, in his 40s, lives in a residential home and comes to stay with his mum at weekends. And in one of our advisory group meetings, um, Monica spoke about um, the experience um, of, of James's um, father dying four years ago and the difficulty he has in, in, in understanding that. And that is part of our talking about dying survey, actually, that, we, um, that we've just run. About 700 staff have given us their views or their experiences of talking about dying. So let me just say, see what Monica has to say about James. Four years ago, he lost his dad. So it's just him and I now. He's finding it um, a bit difficult some weeks because I think with Down syndrome, you, have, you are not aware of the time factors. So he can't tell you um, from day to day if it's a day or a year or a week. If he has to go somewhere, for example, if he's going on holiday, you can't tell him until the very last minute. If not, he would start packing three weeks in advance and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a problem with the time factors with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. um, he still thinks that his dad is coming back, so that is a difficult area for him. Um, there were weeks would go by and he wouldn't mention it, and then there were weeks when he would um, come and start questioning it again. His last trip to was to Florida last year and he visited the Space Center and there he realized that rockets can go into the sky and he says his dad is in heaven and heaven is beyond the sky so he decided that this would be a way to access his dad to mm -hmm. so send a rocket mm -hmm. up to get him back. So it's not easy eh, for anybody, not easy for James, not easy for his mum, not easy for the staff. These are the kind of issues that we are that, that we are working with. So it's getting on, we're ready for our wine, but let me f first finally tell you um, about our wonderful grassroots group. <coughs> this is a group of people with learning disabilities that I meet with every month. And mon every month we talk about dying and bereavement and loss. And I started this group about three years ago because I wanted to widen the pool of people with learning disabilities who are able to think and talk about death. But you can't just expect people to contribute to a meeting where you talk about dying without having worked through some of your own and talked through some of your own issues because it brings up memories of your own losses. So we have perhaps a surprising amount of fun, um, but we also... <laughs> do things like visit our wonderful puppy's funeral. I think that some of them are here. Yes, there they are. Um, oh, the funeral director around the corner. Um, I quite fancy one of those cardboard coffins stacked on the top. Um, we visit graveyards. So there's a picture of that later. Um, we talk about death and bereavement a lot. Um, and we visited hospice. And people ask really the most excellent questions. I mean, again, that made me realise that I don't understand what death is, really. I'm a professor in this, but I have no idea because... Where does the spirit go? And do bodies feel it when they burn in the oven? 
Well, no. Oh, but 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 if your aren't bodies and minds and spirits all interconnected? That's what we say. And if that's so, then if the spirit goes on, why don't you feel your body burn? Do dead people know that they're dead? Really good questions, right? I'm stumped here. So this is a wonderful group, um, the grassroots group. They helped me to advise NHS England um, last year on, on, their, um, on their national guidance. Um, so that was published. And you may well wonder... Um, <laughs> what this bird is doing that keeps popping up <laughs> in this. This is um, our mascot, this big bird. And it's surprisingly helpful actually to have somebody to hold, something to hold when you're sharing difficult stories or when you're giving an inaugural lecture. <laughs> so, so, hopefully, in the last 20 years, we know a lot more than we did 20 years ago. Hopefully, services, well, I know services are a lot better at including people with learning disabilities. Um, I don't think this now hopefully happens anymore, that people really are, um, you know, part of things. Um, and I'm immensely grateful, really, that um, Kingston and St. George's University has recognised the importance of my mission to include everyone in all's well that ends well, and to give me the world's first chair in intellectual disability and palliative care. And this is our group of some of our most excellent researchers that we have at the faculty. And I'm pleased to say that I'm no longer the only person um, doing research around this. These are some of the groups I've worked with in recent years, researchers and, and others, um, some from the UK, some from the Netherlands. You're very welcome. They've come over to be here today, um, a European group. Um, because I still have very many unanswered questions. I want to know why, despite all these years of recommendations, pe so many people still do not have their needs recognised. Why do people's deaths come as such a surprise often without any planning or preparation or support? And I was thinking of my key message for the lecture is listen to people. And I thought, well, why on earth does it take 15 years of research to know, to be able to tell you that? It's so obvious, right? It's so obvious that sometimes I think, well, what am I doing, really? I mean, I'm just sort of stating the obvious. But then why then does that not happen still? So where do things go wrong? And I hope that it's clear from this lecture that you cannot, and no researcher can find answers to these questions on their own. What we need is a research community. And in just a minute, I'm going to show you exactly what such a research community looks like in real life. But before I do that, I promised on my flyer, I think it says, that this is going to be a life-affirming and uplifting type of lecture, despite the topic. So, in honour of that, I'm going to give the final words to some of the members of my grassroots group. Um, and I'm going to ask you to think about the same question that we asked them, which is, what's on your bucket list? What would you like to do? I've been to Disney World, so that's, I've been to both, I've been to the one in Florida and the one in, in Euro Disney, in the one in France, um, to go to different countries that I haven't been to before, like maybe Canada and mm -hmm. I would like to, like to travel. You're going to travel around yeah, the world, yeah, yes. Yeah. And I would, I would like to go on a cruise as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I would have to find someone to come, to obviously, to come, to come with me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I've always, you know, thought that I wanted to go to America to go to Elvis Presley's Graceland as, you know, a, um, a fan and everything. Um, but then it costs a hell of a lot of money, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you're talking, you're talking £16,000, you know, <laughs> just what, you know, for that. Um, but that's, I mean, I, I, that's what I thought then, but 
Now, I would like just to spend my life with my partner and going along as we are, you know, and making her happy, you know, loving her to bits and um, trying to get a job so I can spend money on her. I mean, I spend money on her now, but um, a little bit more. Um, you know, buy her new clothes and, you know, make sure that she's got, you know, stuff like that. If she's, if she runs low, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's my wish. I'd like to, um, go and visit where, um, where I was born. Because life is so precious. Yeah. Life is very precious. Yeah. Thank you to all of you who've come along this evening, particularly my family and my friends, and some of you have come from a really very long way. Um, and I'm really touched by that. I've even spotted some people from my choir who have nothing to do with death or dying, usually. <laughs> <laughs> well done for putting up with this topic. Now, I wonder if any of you who has recognised yourselves in any of my pictures, or who has ever worked with me in any way, can you raise your hands? Right. Now, this is my research community, so I, was, I want you to... I'm going to ask you, all of you with your hands raised, get up and come forward, right? And whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to play um, the music that was sung by uh, my very first research participant. It's a recording of a man who died of cancer in 2006, and this is a tribute to him and everybody else. Thank you to Irena. Yeah. It's my, my pleasure to uh, provide a vote of thanks and closing remarks. And uh, I would just like to say, you know, Baroness Hollins, uh, Principal Hyam, esteemed colleagues travelling from abroad, and families, your family here, and your very good friends and your co researchers. Thank you so much for coming. And Irena, your, your lecturer has beautifully shared your research and you've made such an important contribution to so many people's lives. And really it does seem that this friendship and commitment that you have for people with learning disabilities and to their families has really underpinned the research and meant that the value you bring to such, such a large community of researchers and the importance that brings to the NHS is um, really evident because of that. I asked your colleagues, because I'm relatively new to the uh, research community here, about you, and they said you are a true role model, and they really admire you. And I know that uh, Vari Drennan, Professor Vari Drennan, and uh, Baroness Hollins, and um, Professor Leopold, who's come to support you here as well, were so proud of you getting your chair and your professorial appointment, and it's so well deserved. So. Uh, we look forward to uh, following your career now, as I'm sure you'll be moving forward into much larger programmes and continuing to make a, a very big difference. 
and we look forward to welcoming everyone to a reception just outside. But I think we'll just put our hands together one last time and congratulate the <laughs>